of Zimbabwe is through your checking account. So, so they and don't tell anybody, or you, you'll get caught. You won't get get your money. So, it's more directly profit oriented, but amounts to the same thing. Aha! Someone has joined us, and I think they've got your dog held hostage. Anyway, so all right. Um, so all right. So this is the, well, I guess I won't go through that one. So this is the last lecture. We're here at 123. Um, come on, move. My computer is moving at its own pace. All right, so um, I'm gonna finish the cryptography section. We're not gonna do chapter 13. It's not all that important. No, no class next week. I will be in China and I didn't want, this particular class happens at, at one in the morning in China, so I decided not to attempt to do it from there. Um, so the, well, it's already recorded from previous semester if you want to see it. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. If you want to see chapter 13, but it won't be on the final or anything. Yeah, and you could, you could view that video if you want. But anyway, um, so I can put a link here to it if you like. But um, if you go to my old classes, it's there. I might not put it here because that would confuse people into thinking they need to, to have it for the final. But anyway, final's already up. I was going to have it up by finals week, but I said, why am I waiting until the final is up? You have until the end of finals week to take it, but you can only take it once. Uh, it's an hour long, I think it's 15 or 20 questions, not very long, and uh, tries to cover the whole book, so it's much shallower than your quizzes. So are there any questions about anything? Just the quiz. Yeah, just like the quizzes. Yeah. And also, um, the scores are up. A bunch of people already have an A. All the people in green have an A. The people in yellow have a B. Other people can look here to see what they have and plan to do whatever they want. Um, I think one of these classes, I did have the wrong total there, and it might have been this class because I had planned to have an extra quiz. And so uh, the whole number of points went down by 20. So yeah, yeah, this, I think that did happen a week or two ago that I found, I think I that mistake pretty often that the total was off by a little, so I changed it. But anyway, it was in your favor, so I didn't figure I'd get too many complaints. But anyway, um, so hey, somebody's already almost up to 1,000. One of my students was asking me how many people got 1,000 in my classes. I don't think anybody ever has, but you could. I knew a guy that uh, took like a class that only had 200 points in one unit class and got like 800 points by just doing all this extra stuff. Was, a lot of my students are not particularly motivated by points. They're just interested in the, tech, the field and they're happy to do a whole bunch more than required for the class, which is fine. It is, it is, it is. And you know the point, I, some people really care about the grade. They're trying to get a degree, they're trying to transfer. So, you know, I once took a class from a teacher who was a brilliant lecturer, but she didn't, grading system made no sense at all. You had no idea whether you were getting an A or a D halfway through. And I said, you know, that just really isn't right. To some people, it really matters. They really need to get an A and they really need to know if they're getting an A. That's not too much to ask. There ought to be some clear system. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah. It's 85 points. Oh, it's 85. Yeah, yeah. Good. So it's about like four quizzes. Yeah. yeah. So you can do that if you like, or you can just do more projects like these people have, and then you don't even need to take the final, although they could. It won't change their grade. Okay. So we're up to cryptography, and this is really important. So it's good to go through, and and uh, you'll see it in every security talk. You, you, the same thing is into 30 plus, and the CISSP in many classes. Um, with only minor variations because there's only a few essential concepts to get. There's only three mathematical types of transformation that we need. And those are hashing, symmetric cryptography, and asymmetric cryptography. There are a million other things out there like group theory and uh, uh, Hilbert spaces and all these interesting mathematical constructs, but those are the three that matter to us. So hashing, the previous part talked about symmetric and asymmetric cryptography in general terms, and hashing, is an integrity control. That's all it is. It does not provide confidentiality. It does not conceal a message that can then be recovered. It conceals a message by destroying it, so it can never be recovered um, in principle. Although in practice, you can do password cracking uh, with a lack of mathematical perfection, but you can do it to some extent. Anyway, the point of hashing algorithm is to put a fingerprint on a file, so you can tell if that file has been modified. So you take an input of any length, and you run it through a hash function and it just scrambles up all the bits and creates a final answer, which is always the same, there's no key. And so if you 
make a copy of the file or send it over network and then hash it again, you'll get the same answer unless something has been broken. And that's the primary point of it is so you can download a file and make sure it was not altered in transit. Um, this, the original simplest hashing function was called parity. Back in the very, very early days, you had an eight bit byte. You only needed seven bits to encode a character and the eighth bit was the parity bit. So you adjusted it so that the total number of bits in every byte was either even or odd. And that meant if you sent it through a network and it dropped one bit, you could detect that because it would no longer be even or odd. If it was to drop two bits, you would not detect that. So it didn't find all errors, but it found a lot of errors. And you could use the parity to detect if you have an erroneous transmission and then retransmit until the parity is not broken. Then you have a higher degree of probability that the answer is what it should be. That was not perfect, but it was fast and simple. Then we went up to CRC32, which makes a 32-bit hash, which is what Ethernet uses at layer two to verify frames. And many more hashing systems were developed as we had more and more need to protect larger and larger objects with a higher degree of precision. CRC32, for example, gives a 32-bit hash on each Ethernet packet, and it is compared. So when you receive a frame on Ethernet, it takes the frame, your NIC does it, calculates the CRC32, compares it to the CRC32 that was sent, and if it doesn't match, it rejects the frame, saying this frame was damaged in transit, send it again. Now that blocks most normal transmission errors, like errors in Wi-Fi transmission, but it will not stop a malicious attacker. Because CRC32 is very short, you can easily modify a packet maliciously, so it will still have the same CRC32. So it's not intended to protect you from intelligent hackers. It's just intended to pick up defects in the network, in the transmission. And that's why you need stronger and stronger hashing algorithms. The main measure of how good a hashing algorithm is, is whether it has collisions. Here you meet one of the many uh, imperfect mathematical ideas in cryptography. Uh, a, every hash method has collisions for a very simple reason. If you take a hash and it only has 160 bits, like SHA-1, there are only two to the 160 possible hash values. But if you put in an input file that's a megabyte, it has two to the eight million bits. So there are very many files that hash to the same value because there are very many fewer hash values than there are possible files. So there are always collisions in every hash value. There are different things which could be hashed and produce the same value. But if that were true and you downloaded a file, you wouldn't, in a hash match, you don't really know the file hasn't been modified because there are other files with the same hash value. So what you do is you lower your standard from requiring that you have a perfect transformation with no collisions to settling for something where you don't need to worry about the collisions. So you want the collisions to be so infrequent that you can't find them. And this is what cryptography really is, which is why it is not perfect mathematics and why it keeps changing so fast. Cryptography is not a matter of scrambling things so no one can get in without the key. It's a matter of scrambling it so it's very expensive today to get in without the key. And as time passes, it, people start getting in where they couldn't get in before. And that's why it's an approximation. It's a value judgment, it's very far from beautiful, perfect math. And so um, MD5 was developed 128 bits long. It became very widely deployed, used in many applications, and it was never approved by the government for any purpose because this was back in the 80s and 90s, and the government did not have any certifications for cryptography routines at that time because it was not considered something that a normal person would ever use. It was considered only something that banks and spies would use, so there wasn't any rating system for it. And um, so everybody used MD5, but MD5 is too short and it has known collisions. And you can run algorithms that will create two files with the same MD5 hash. And I used to have that in a project, so it might still be there, a project where you play with some of these files that have identical MD5s. You can create them, it takes some considerable computing power to make them, you can't just make them in, in five minutes on a virtual machine, but you can do them. And so MD5 cannot be trusted. If you download a file and the MD5 is the same, that does not really mean the file has not been modified. In practice, it means that nobody quickly, casually modified it, but a malicious attacker could do that. So we went up to SHA-1. SHA-1 has this funny sounding name. MD5 is um, Message Digest 5, I think from Ron Revest. It's the fifth one he made. SHA is a government sample of approval, like AES and DES. DES was the data encryption system. AES is the advanced encryption system. SHA is the secure hash algorithm. That is a government stamp of approval placed on an algorithm uh, written by IBM. I think, I forget who wrote it, but anyway, so this is SHA-1. This is the most popular one in the world. 
it, it's a little bit longer than MD5, 160 bits, so in hexadecimal it looks like that. And uh, this was much better. Yeah. 160. MD5 is 128, SHA is 160. A little bit longer, but enough. And the, per the reason for that is um, because of the birthday attack, we'll get to, um, it you, if you just hash random files and look for collisions, the number of files you'll have to hash to find a collision is the square root, a two to half of the length. And two to half of 128 is two to the 64, and that's unfortunately not a big enough number. 64-bit hashes have been cracked by brute force, by encryption. But two to the 160, half of that is two to the 80, and two to the 80 is still an unachievable number of calculations to do. That was why it was designed for this. So if SHA-1 operated as designed, it would there would be no collisions ever found because you would have to do two to the 80 calculations to find them, and all the computers in the world running for all the time you have cannot do two to the 80 calculations. That's, what's that? Yeah. Well, and that, that's right, yes. And then we had the argument we had last time, it depends on which model of predicting the future. If the future proceeds linearly, you will never be able to do it. But if the future proceeds according to Moore's law, then that's only maybe one or two decades away. So unfortunately, SHA-1 has mathematical flaws. And this would came out about 10 years ago. Some Chinese mathematicians began to notice that there were mathematical defects in SHA-1, so they were able to find ways to zero in on the collisions faster. So you do not really need to do two to the 80 calculations. And they got it down to like two to the 72 and then two to the 68 or something. People said, you know, pretty soon that's going to be reachable. So they did. Earlier, uh, about a year ago, Google found the first SHA-1 collision. Um, and everybody knew it was coming. They could see the difficulty going down, and the computers getting faster, and they could predict pretty clearly in the next couple of years, we're going to have collisions. Now you can decide how much you care. In practice, most of the time, people use MD5, and it's fine. And if you use SHA-1, the odds are very good that you still fine, but it could bother you that in principle you can't trust it, and it just depends on what level of security you want. But browser manufacturers have decided to push this, so they've refused to accept HTTPS certificates based on MD5 for a while, and that's probably good because I think five years ago at DEF CON, hackers actually forged the MD5-based root certificate for the main certificate authority, and were able to, which was VeriSign at that time, and they were actually able to make fake HTTPS certificates that worked because VeriSign was very slow to upgrade to SHA-1. That humiliated them in upgrading to SHA-1. That has not been done for SHA-1 yet. But within 10 years, that will probably be possible to do for SHA-1. So they're already forcing everyone to knock it off and go to SHA-2. Um, because the government saw this coming a long time ago, the National Institute of Standards had a competition to choose SHA-2, and that happened. And there's SHA-2 already available, and they recently they even found SHA-3. Because the same Chinese cryptographers that found mathematical flaws in SHA-1 a decade ago found that SHA-2 may suffer from similar problems. So even though SHA-2 is much longer, it has 256, 384, and 512 bits, it is not as strong as it should be. Now it is so much longer that even if it's half as good as it should be, that would be enough. But they said, you know, it might be that SHA-2 will turn out to fall too, so they had the contest and made SHA-3. So we have that sitting around in case we need it. But right now, nobody cares about SHA-3 at all. It's not being used in any application that anybody makes, but what they are all scrambling to do is to move from SHA-1 to SHA-2. And as far as anybody knows, SHA-2 should be fine for decades or centuries. But in case it isn't, we already have SHA-3 ready to switch to if necessary. So that was the thing. Uh, 6,000 years of processor time it took to find a SHA-1 collision. That's why SHA-1 is still pretty good. Unless your adversary is basically the NSA or a huge corporation, it's unlikely that they really have enough resources to do this to you. Yeah. No, not yet. No, um, it's not anything we could ever do in any reasonable amount of time with a virtual machine. You know, you need to get like a thousand Amazon machines. Ten thousand Amazon machines could do it in three months. You know, so it's not at all within the range of homework. I have some MD5 projects. That's within range of homework. <laughs> but yeah, this is um, this and this may this won't become practical until computers are a lot faster for us. But they have this place where you can download these files and hash them, and they made two PDF documents that you can view, and you can see them, and they don't have the same Shaw value, but they have different pictures. So it's really kind of pretty. They made nice looking ones. So um, that's the shattered files. 
So this is the uh, motion of all the browsers to deprecate SHA-1. Browsers are really pushing security forward. Another thing that's going to happen, I think, later this year is um, Chrome is going to mark every website insecure if it uses HTTP instead of HTTPS, even if you are not putting in a password or anything. And that is a very good idea because I've been going through it in the web security class. Even if you're not putting your password in something, if the website is not HTTPS, any attacker can be adding extra JavaScript to it and cookies and the wire. And, you know, a bunch of horrible things can happen to you even if you're not typing a password into it. You really just shouldn't be using HTTP at all. And that's where we're going. Pretty soon the browsers are going to be humiliating everybody that doesn't use HTTPS. And as you see, uh, they're, they're supposedly as of 2017, Microsoft, Google, and Mozilla end trust for all SHA-1 certificates. But my impression is that that did not happen. Uh, let's take this secure site, samsclass.info, and look at the certificate. And the details are here. And I'm afraid zooming in doesn't make that bigger, but I can make it bigger for the people in the room. Um, all right. So if you look down here, oh, it's signed with SHA-256, which is SHA-2. Good. So that's all right. Let's try a few others and see how this is Chrome, which is usually the pickiest. Let's try Google and see what they're using. Uh, here's the certificate. Details. Signed with SHA-256. Good. I'm glad to see it. I thought I found one of these that was SHA-1, but maybe not. Let's try Bing. Bing was not encrypted at all until like a month or two ago. Now it's secure, which would suggest it should be good because no one will sell you a SHA-1-based certificate anymore. I think some people are still using them because they're using old certificates. But um, Bing is also signed by SHA-256. Okay, good. So maybe it's true. I thought I saw a SHA-1 in one of these classroom demos, but anyway... Um, SHA-1s are supposedly no good anymore, not for a while. So that forces everybody to upgrade their stuff to SHA-2. Now, if you really want to find out, you can use the Qualys SSL labs, and this is good, clean fun. Qualys SSL test. There we are. And one thing that's good about this, you can do this to anybody's site, not just yours. This is the kind of thing that is, encourages like consumers and stuff. So if I wonder about Bing, I can go to Bing at their supposedly secure website, and I can say, I wonder how secure that certificate really is. Now, this, by the way, is not a complete security test of the website. That would involve looking for things like cross-site scripting. This is just testing the quality of their certificate to see if their certificate obeys all the modern best practices. And it's very good if you're learning cryptography to try a few sites here because there are a lot of mistakes you can make that are not obvious. So it might going to take a minute or so. We'll come back to it. But they, this tests against the current recommendations, and it rates your thing from A to F. So here's what CCSF had when I tried it a year or two ago. We had a B. Um, I tested all the colleges in 2014, and you see most of them had A, B, or C, but there was 15 or 20 of them that had Fs. They had out-of-date certificates. I tested the banks, the top 100 banks, and only one of them had an F. And um, then when I went to 2016, uh, it was a small bank someplace, um, not around here, I forget, but they, um, next time I went, they had like put in a special mark, mark to refuse to let people test them anymore, which is one response. I mean, I may have heard, I, I, I think I told you there was a, there was a high school about four or five years ago where the teacher was saying racist things in class. So one of the students used their phone and made a video and put it on YouTube. So the high school sprang into action and enforced a policy, no more phones in class. That was how they fixed it. Anyway, um, that's usually what you get, is a vigorous attempt to sweep it under the rug. There, stamp it down, now everything's fine again. Um, that is so much cheaper for management than actually doing something about the problem. So here's the four. In 2016, it still had NEF, Middlesex, Trustco, HSA, and Intrust. Um, so on it goes, and to be fair, you gotta realize it doesn't mean, they weren't, the reason they didn't fail in 2014 is because the standards are different. They're still using the same certificate, probably. It's just the rules changed under them, which is why crypto is famous for being so hard. You can do it right, and if you don't have a smart person on your team watching it, a couple of years later, people say whatever you're doing isn't good because the rules change. It's frustrating. But every time there's a new attack, everybody freaks out. So here's the five Fs at credit unions. Um, again, none of them around here. Dear employees, credit union. These are the five that got Fs at the top credit unions. And I just did this every while again. It's, it's interesting to see. I, I sort of like the fact that you can do this in America. You can 
investigate somebody's security without their permission, um, it is arguably illegal. Um, illegal. Illegal. Certainly, when I, when I research Android apps, uh, Staple, was it Staples? I think it was Staples, did send me a cease and desist letter and say, you, our terms of service say you are not allowed to inspect the security of our app. You are breaking the law. Um, and they might be right in terms of DMCA, but when I asked my lawyer, he said, no, inspecting the security of an app is fair use. But it would be argued in court. It is not as legal as I wish it were, but it's not 100% illegal either. It is in the gray area, which is where almost everything we do is. And also you have, uh, you, you can embarrass them. I can, but they can then complain. And you know, this is what Donald Trump on the campaign trail said a lot, is we're going to open up the libel laws so you can shut up people that criticize you in the press because he's really tired of all the bad press he gets. As you know, he gets a lot of bad press. <laughs> and um, like they're mad at him just for lying all the time. And he doesn't think they should say that. And they really have learned not to say it. I've, I'm watching us descend into, uh, I watched uh, to cover you the latest thing. First he lied about this sex with a porn star and the payoff. Then Giuliani admitted the truth. Now he's back to lying again. And I heard the news announcers carefully avoiding saying he'd ever lied, making very careful statements that won't offend him as much. Just like in other countries, you never contradict the leader because you'll vanish with the death squad at night. And they warned us. That's what everyone screamed about. Our, our standards will go down. But since he lies constantly, um, unless you want to like appear to be just unreasonable, you have to not really say that openly anymore or people will just turn to another channel and call you biased and call you fake news and everything. And it is, it is working. Anyway, um, I heard in some of the press conferences earlier, they had, they had European, I think a Spanish reporter was there asking the president hard questions. And the commentator said, you know, no American reporter would dare ask that question anymore. Cause you'll be punished, barred from all future conferences, lose your press credentials. You know, just it's, it's disturbing where we're going. But it's not just us, it's the whole world sinking back into fascism. Anyway, so the digital signature makes sure the thing has not been modified in transit, and you can now have authenticity and non-repudiation, which we talked about before. So here's the summary of the algorithms. Symmetric algorithms, there are a lot of them out there. DES is the old one that is not safe anymore, was pushed by the government until it became impossible for them to sustain the lie that it was safe. Um, triple DES is fine, but slow. AES is the currently recommended best one to use. Fastest, most efficient, and as far as anybody knows, completely secure. And especially the 256-bit version will probably remain unbreakable even as quantum computers come online. So AES is fine, and I've not heard any talk about upgrading AES. Um, although I think it is included in the post-quantum cryptography competition that is going now, they may recommend new symmetric algorithms, but the quantum uh, theoreticians developing the computers and doing the math on them have told, have said that there's no need for a new symmetric algorithm. The symmetric algorithms are not going to fall from quantum computers. And here's the runners up idea of Blowfish and RC5 or some of the other unapproved ones that are probably just as good as AES. And the ones you use if you really mistrust the government. Um, asymmetric algorithms have, were in used by the secret spy agency for decades, but they hit the public world in the late 70s with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which made it possible to send secrets over an untrusted channel. And RSA became the first one based on prime numbers. This is what's used now. ECC was the elliptic curve version to be more efficient and still secure. And LGML is another version based on a more general formulation of group theory, which I don't think anybody's using much, but it is available. Um, and so the NSA pushed ECC very hard because they had a secret backdoor into it, and it was also saving power, and then the secret backdoor was exposed, and then quantum computers started appearing, so they've recommended we go back to RSA right now. Or if you use ECC, you use much longer keys. Here's the hashing algorithms. There was a series of MDs like MD2 and MD4. MD4 is what Microsoft still uses for their hashes for some ungodly reason. Uh, Microsoft like other large companies, is amazingly slow to upgrade their stuff. They started using MD4 in 1993 for their passwords and have not updated yet. But anyway, MD5 is what most people used, but most people didn't even learn about hashing until MD5 came out, and that's when they built into everything. Uh, SHA-1 was the big upgrade for MD5, and like I say, SHA-2 is what everyone's upgrading to now if they care about being really, really secure. Although, if they're using SHA-1, they're probably fine for a while yet. 
All right, so I got some cahoots about that stuff. And, uh, oh, let's see. Oh, this is there. So I got an A for Bing. Good. We might take a look at that later. We'll see. I figured Bing would be an A because they just bought it very recently. So usually your um, certificate providers will not sell you anything bad. The only reason it's bad is because it's old. Because it's just as cheap for them. It doesn't cost them any more to sell you a good certificate, so they use whatever the recommended algorithms are to sell things today. The problem is they're good for several years, so they often last long enough to become bad. Reminds me, let me try and get, I don't mean to, there, while you people are joining, I'm going to test City College. That's one worth testing. Um, SSL Labs, SSL Test. There. There we are, good, okay. We'll let it test in a minute or so. It takes about a minute for the test. CCSF might not get an A, because we have been doing it for a while. So ours might be a couple of years old by now. All right, I'll wait a few more seconds, see if any more is coming. All right, aha, some more people are coming. Well, it looks like that's it. Okay. <clears throat> So, which one of these is public key encryption? Okay, RSA is the only public key system on that list. Which hash algorithm has no collisions? All right, SHA-2 is the only, SHA-2 and SHA-3 are the only hash algorithms in common use that have no collisions. All right, which system implements hashing? AMD5 is the only hash algorithm there, although RSA includes hashing, but it does more. Which one is 64 bits long? None of them. That is a very strange length. I don't think there's any hash algorithm 64 bits long. That's not long enough to be trusted. For a file download, and if you don't need that security, you mostly use CRC32. If you so, I don't know if there ever has been 164 bits long. I don't know why anybody would want that. So, which one is 160 bits long? That's SHA-1, the most common one, until very recently when everyone is scrambling to SHA-2. So M dot, I know who that is, and Pete and Forrest are probably real names. All right, so let's um, pick up here a bit and yeah, updates. All right, so now we get down to the real dirt, where it's no longer mathematics. Now we have to talk about key handling, which is not math, and it turns out to be the real danger zone. How do you distribute public keys? If I want you to send me a secret, I, you need my public key. Well, how do you know you've got my public key? What about an attacker that puts up a fake public key with my name on it? How do you know that didn't happen? And the answer is you don't. Any more than you know when you look at a driver's license that that's a real driver's license and not a fake driver's license, it's very difficult, as you can imagine. But what we use is public key infrastructure, and that is the system 
to try to distribute keys with some degree of security that they are right. So it's, that's what we've been looking at in those browsers. These SSL certificates are X509 certificates. That's the standard. So the 509 certificate has a name of the company. It has a serial number. It has the name of the company that issued it. And then it has some cryptographic fingerprints. This one here has SHA-1 and MD-5. This is an older one that was not shined with SHA-2, SHA-256, which is what all the ones I looked at today are, because browsers will pop up error messages now. If you try to sign it with SHA-1 or MD-5, that's not considered secure enough anymore by the makers of the popular browsers. By the way, that meant that it's worth mentioning that none of this is enforced by anything resembling a competent authority. Um, there's no government agency, there's no law, there, all there is is just practices and all, basically each browser maker just implements whatever they want. So it is up to Google to decide what they do in Chrome, up to Microsoft to decide what they do in Internet Explorer, and there's no standards or anything. It's just the free market. So uh, here's the, the public keys are issued by a certificate authority. They bind it to your private key. You, they don't never, you do not send your private key to them. You make a certificate signing request, which is a cryptographic object. They sign it, and it verifies your private key without them having it. They should never have your private key. That's the whole point. You never tell anybody your private key. You don't send it over network. You do, however, have to make a backup of it because if your server crashes and you lose it, you can't open any of the messages. So you have to preserve it and you have to have a backup, but you don't tell anybody else. There are some certificate authorities. About a few weeks ago, they were humiliating them madly on Twitter that actually have a page where you type in your private key and send it to them. And then they keep it in a database at that end. And everybody was screaming and railing about how these idiots should be driven out of the business. They totally don't understand what's going on here. That's wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Nobody else should ever see your private key. That's what makes it secure. Anyway, um, so your certificate can expire. In order to make money, they only let it be valid for a certain period of time. And then you have to pay for renewal. You can renew it and keep using the same key, or you can get a new key. Um, if it expires, then warnings will pop up in the browser saying something's wrong with the certificate. Um, you can also revoke it. If, um, for example, your certificate authority gets hacked and they lose their signing key, or if you lose your key and you know that has happened, you can tell them, I don't want anyone trusting that key anymore. Uh, this happened to Microsoft. Microsoft, um, someone who was not Microsoft went to VeriSign and used social engineering and convinced them they were Microsoft and got two certificates from Microsoft that were not Microsoft employees, and those keys were specifically revoked. And when I used to teach Windows desktop support, you could go in the properties of Internet Explorer and find special patches in there to block those two certificates. Uh, so you can get bad keys. That's what you do if, for some reason, there is a bad certificate out there, you revoke it. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question. And for uh, the question is, do you have a public and private key in your browser? And the answer is you do. When you connect to a secure website, your browser creates a public and private key pair right away for temporary use, and it uses that to communicate with the secure website. And when you close the browser, it throws it away and makes a new one next time. Your end is an ephemeral key. The server's end is the same key for years. They buy a key and use it for everybody for several years until it expires, and then they buy a new one. But your browser makes a separate key for every exchange. So you are doing it, but it's not, you don't have to worry about the key handling because it's only used temporarily. Anyway, so revocation is what you do to permanently remove a certificate. Uh, you can also suspend a certificate for a period of time because my company is reorganizing and we're not using it for a period of time or something. Uh, this is a very miserable system. It doesn't work hardly at all. The original system specified by the RFCs was a certificate revocation list. And you will find, I think, even with modern certificates, let's try the Kahoot certificate. Um, they are supposed to specify the location of the certificate revocation list in this certificate. So we should find somewhere in here information about the CRL. Certificate policies. Uh, CPS, certification, here's the CRL distribution point. So notice, this is kind of horrible. There are more than 100 trusted certificate authorities. Every one of them runs their own certificate revocation list. So this means there's not a central place you can go to find it. 
And what happens is a lot of them don't have put enough servers and bandwidth on this device. So this is, if you click the certificate revocation list, it doesn't load quickly. So what browsers do is they either ignore certificate revocation entirely, or more commonly, they give it a very brief period of time, like 50 milliseconds, and if it doesn't answer, they just go to the site anyway. They fail open. So the certificate revocation list system spectacularly does not work. Tests have shown many, many times you can get in with a revoked certificate, and the user will not see a warning. So there have been attempts to improve this, and the most effective one is the non-standard one in Chrome, which is very simple. There have not been that many revoked certificates in the whole world, so Chrome just stores them all locally, and it just downloads them with your Chrome update. So it does not have to go ask this thing on the web. It already knows the serial number of every expired certificate, and it can just test them. Uh, other browsers don't do that yet, but um, the existing system is pretty much security theater, where it pretends to do a test and it doesn't really do the test. Internet Explorer 3 actually forgot to walk the chain. That was another pretty hilarious one. Well, up here is the chain. Why do I trust that this is Kahoot? Well, I trust it because Komodo RSA said it was Kahoot. Well, why do I trust them? I trust them because Komodo RSA up here says them. Why do I trust them? I trust them because of Ad Trust, and Ad Trust is built into my browser. So this is the chain of trust. This is signed by that. This is signed by the one above it. This is signed by the one above it. And my browser has to verify all of those steps, or you can't trust it. And Internet Explorer 3 only checked one step. So this is a common social engineering trick. You send someone a letter saying US government is impounding all your money, hand it over, and if you don't believe me, call this phone number. When you call that phone number, it's my buddy, pretend you be the agent. You never actually reach anybody of authority, and you fall for it if you only go one step up. If you don't go all the way to the authority that was built in the browser, you have no reason to trust it. So that was a mistake they made there. People often make mistakes in this system because users will never notice, because the sites work fine, and uh, the attacks are rare. Anyway, uh, you can add a strict transport security header to your web page. And if you do, then it will tell the browser this page should always be loaded over HTTPS, never over HTTP. So this was highly recommended. And if you ever see the page even once, your browser will remember for the next long, you can set a, the length of this, and you can make it for years. So for years after, it'll always be HTTPS. And as I say, the browsers have finally gotten so fed up with it, they're pretty much going to enforce this for everything from now on. They're going to pop up error messages for everything that's just on HTTPS in the first place pretty soon, which will greatly improve the security of the web. And you can see it here. Here's Facebook. I've opened Facebook page. I opened developer tools. And you see down here, strict transport security with this age, which is some large number. So Facebook has moved to HTTPS, and they put the HSTS tag on their server. So anybody that goes to the real Facebook even once will never be fooled by the fake Facebook thereafter because their browser will know that it should always be voted securely. This is a good idea, a recommended best practice. The only problem is you have to be serious about being HTTPS. You can't decide later to go back to HTTP because everybody's browser is already locked into being HTTPS. So you have to really consider all the cost and make sure that you're okay with all your advertising partners and everybody else because once you do it, there's no going back. Yeah. Right. Actually, that's a very good question. I'm repeating for the recording. The question is, if you just type the name of a, a URL in the browser and press enter, what happens? And the answer is, it depends on what browser you're using. If you are using Chrome, Chrome has already memorized the top 1,000 websites and whether they should be secure or not. So if it knows they should be secure, it goes directly to the HTTPS version. Otherwise, it tries HTTP first and then HTTPS, and that is what the RFCs used to say they should do, and that is what most browsers still do. Chrome, again, violates the official rules to make you more secure uh, with this non-standard technique of memorizing. Um, and like many, there have been huge arguments about this, of course. Like I say, it appears like the final result is Every, the browser manufacturers have all pretty much decided that everything should just be HTTPS. And I think by the end of the year, it pretty much will be. And they're enforcing this stuff without anybody's permission, just by making browsers pop out error messages, and that will irritate everybody that doesn't have HTTPS. So you might notice the madness and chaos of this. I remember when I, I worked many years ago with a woman from East Germany, and I told her, how do you inflate her in the stock market? And I said, you know, your company borrows money, their stock is up there, it just goes up and down, there's no control at all. If there's a scandal about your company, the stock will fall to zero and you're all fired. And she said, I wouldn't want to live under such a system. 
And maybe not. But anyway, the, the internet security is very much that way. It's just random companies doing things. And if the browser manufacturers decide to do something, that pressures everybody else into obeying their rules. It's, it's the free market for what it's worth, instead of any rational organization or government. So you gotta back up your keys. If you lose your private keys, then you can't read any of that stuff and that's no good. So you gotta back it up. Your certificate authority has private keys too to sign things and they have to back up their keys. So they have to have a key recovery policy. Um, the certificates are built into your browser. Internet Explorer, here's the list from a few years ago. You just have a list of about 100 companies and anything they say you trust, although that is changing. By the way, Chrome also knows who should sign those top 1,000 websites. So if suddenly Google is signed by the government of China, Internet Explorer will say, oh, it's fine, they're on the list. But Chrome will say, wait, that's not okay. Chrome should not be signed by the government of China today. They know it shouldn't. And that is, again, a non-standard um, additional layer of security added by to Chrome that's not in other browsers. So you can make your own certificate authority. It's not a complicated server. It's really not any big deal. It doesn't have to do any more math than your browser does to connect to it. You just have to turn on service. In Windows Server, you just turn on certificate services, and then you just specify um, it's one of the optional Windows components you can add. Then you specify how long the key should be, what algorithm to use. This is old stuff back in the days when SHA-1 was the most secure choice. But and then your, your server will now hand out certificates, but nobody will trust them because you're not on the trusted list. So the recommended way to do this, is you make your own certificate authority because you're too cheap to pay for real certificates. Then you put the, your certificate authority as a trusted authority in the browsers of all the company laptops. And now all your employees will not see error messages when they go to your pages that are signed by it. That is one way to do it. However, now Let's Encrypt gives everybody free HTTPS certificates and they're now the most popular encryption service on the planet. Um, so it, the idea that it's expensive to get HTTPS certificates is out of date. They are all free now. And when they first came out, I was skeptical of them because I thought they would just go broke and vanish, but they've been out for several years now. No one's had any problems with them and they've become very popular. So everybody is trusting them, even though they live entirely, I think, from donations. So I. It's like many of the open source things, it's not entirely clear why people trust them as much as they do, but they do. Certainly, I've never heard anybody impugn their integrity. The EFF is very trustworthy. They are not taking bribes or lying to anybody about cryptography, so you can trust them to sell you proper stuff. Yeah. Like when you get a certificate Yeah. No, you never get the, that's very important. You never get the root certificate's private key. What you do is your certificate contains a signature and you verify that with the root certificate's public key. Now, but that's the whole point of cryptography. You can sign, the public key cryptography, you can sign something and anybody can verify the signature without your private key. You sign it with the private key and it's verified with your public key. Actually, it doesn't have the Signature. Right, you're just verifying a signature. So when the root, when the uh, when you send a certificate signing request to the certificate authority saying I have created a private key and I want you to sign this public key, they then sign the public key with their private key. So now anybody that uses it can check with them that their public key, which is built into your browser, and verify that it's a valid signature, and then they know that they have your public key and they can trust it. That's how the system works. Nobody ever tells anybody else their private key. But, yeah, yeah, you send, if I were to join the game, I make a private key, then I calculate a public key, then I send the public key to a certificate authority with a key signing request, and I used to pay a fee for this. They then sign it, adding a signature based on their private key, which comes back to me, and that goes in my certificate the X501 certificate. So anybody that wants to connect to me can find a public key there with my name on it, and they can find a signature which matches the certificate authority's public key. And that means they know that that certificate authority signed it with their private key, which I don't have, and that certificate authority is attesting that I really am who I claim to be. So presumably when I bought it, they made some effort to make sure I was not lying about my identity. Yeah. So it's my public key and theirs and their signature that they, they provide a signature. And their signature is formed with their private key, 
but anybody can verify it with their public key. And their public key is well known and built into your browser. So your browser has high confidence that it knows the public key of every trusted root certificate authority. So the system, from a mathematical point of view, it's almost perfect. The only way to fool it is to somehow uh, have a mistake in the implementation or make a fake public key or hack the certificate authority or something. If those certificate authorities are not hacked or lying, it's essentially a perfect system as far as the mathematics goes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, VPNs have different types. Uh, the most common type of VPN has a shared secret that you typed in and it's also at the server. Another way to make a VPN is using HTTPS only, where it uses this system, and then you would just use a temporary key for the connection. That is not the most common type. The most common type, though, is L2TP with IPsec. And when you configure it, you do have to type in a secret, like a password, at both ends. No, SFTP runs over HTTPS. And that uses exactly the system where the only certificate is at the server end. And your end just uses a temporary key just while you have the session. And when you make a new session, you make a new key. So yeah, that's very important. So, so the client needs to restart Yes, if you're using, there are systems like SSH that do not have this public key infrastructure. They don't have a system of trusted authorities. You make your key and it's not signed by anybody, so they're vulnerable. If you use SSH, you have to agree. The first time you connect, it will tell you, I haven't seen this server before, is this the right key? That's because you don't have this system of certificate authorities. This is why uh, Steve Gibson, one of the fundamental guys in the early days of the internet, it hates this whole thing about HTTPS. A lot of people do. HTTPS means you trust these 100 companies, you pay them all this money, and everything's dependent on money. And every, a lot of people of the open source type are very much against that. And they want to have some other way of trusting people without trusting a central authority. And um, they have other systems like SSH where you have a fingerprint and you're supposed to somehow know the fingerprint. Um, or you have your friends or friends sign the key, so because you trust individual people and they know each other, you feel like you have the right public key. There are many systems. Um, however, I think Let's Encrypt has really disrupted this space. Now there is a nonprofit, free, widely trusted entity that you could be the one you trust, instead of trusting a huge company like RSA or VeriSign or something, which is where a lot of people that, that hate the capitalism don't want to trust those kind of people. And by the way, with some justice, because they have been revealed to take bribes a lot to lie to people. So they're not all that trustworthy. So, uh, but you do, the, the most popular system does depend on you trusting some huge company and believing everything they say. But H, the SSH, like you're describing, does not. And therefore, it is susceptible to a man in the middle attack. If I'm in the middle, when you first connect, I can give you the wrong key and you will never know. That's, that's a fundamental weakness of the system. Yeah. Um, if you write something like OpenVPN and you fake a certificate on the server, yeah. you access that server and you have that user account that has a specific user ID and that's right. Um, password has a password. And it has a shared secret. There's like a password. That's OpenVPN is a common type and you had to put a, a password on the server and you had to type password locally too. So it is really not public key encryption. It is private key encryption. You can do that with AES or anything if you have a shared secret. You had to somehow securely move a secret from you to the server at one point. So you can just keep using it. So the open VPN is fine, but it, it, um, it depends on a shared secret. So it doesn't solve the problem that public key encryption solves. These are very good questions. You guys are thinking about it. Anyway, so let's talk about some attacks. The simplest attack is where you just snip the traffic and try to read it. If it's not encrypted at all, you can totally see it, and that's but the chapter one of the cryptography book that's famous, um, Practical Cryptography, is the first thing you do to break cryptography is check for plain text. It often turns out that cryptography fails. Very frequently, these supposedly encrypted connections are not really encrypted. So you've just tried to see. You, this is what happened to the police radios. The police have encrypted radios because they used to use CB, or anybody can just read it. So they gave them encrypted radios. But unfortunately, at least in New York City, and I think nationwide, they passed a law 
that they have to change the key every 30 days. There was a good talk from a visiting speaker last week where he talked about this rule where you had to change your password every 90 days, which turned out to just make everything worse and not better. Because I always wondered, what is the sense of that? Is it okay for a hacker to use my system for 90 days? Then what exactly is the benefit of changing my key every 90 days? And, and so it turns out that the police radios, it is very difficult to change the key. So when you send a batch of them to tech support to change the key, they don't succeed in many of the radios. So the cops find out that when you call somebody on the radio, it doesn't work. So they all learn to just turn off the encryption because you can't even get through otherwise. So anyway, that's the first thing, just sniffing. If it is encrypted, you can then try to attack. There are active attacks um, and passive attacks. So normally the system that is used, the algorithm is not secret. You're using a standard algorithm like AES, and the only thing secret is the key. So uh, there are various kinds of attacks. The first one is just a hash collision. A common classroom demonstration is if we just get everybody's birthday in the room, just month and day, it will turn out by the time you have 20 or 30 students, two people have the same birthday. Naively, you would think it would take 180 students to have the same birthday or 365. And if I just pick a day like January 1 and try to find somebody out there with January 1, that will take about 180 students. But for two people to match, it doesn't have to be any particular number. I could match you, I could match you, you could match him. So the question is, how many pairs of people are there? And if you have 23 people, there's 23 times 22 over two pairs, which gets up to around 180. So there are a lot of chances. So this is why I say, if you have a 128-bit hash algorithm, there are two to the 128 hashes, but you're only going to have to hash two to the 64 files before you find a collision because any of those files could match any of the others. And once you've done two to the 64 files, there are two to the 128 pairs of files. So it is, that's why hash, hash functions have to be twice as long as the maximum number of calculations you can possibly do. So they started with 128 because they thought two to the 64 was an unachievable number, and that wasn't good enough, that was MD5. They went to 160 because two to the 80 was an unachievable number, and that should have been fine, but because of mathematical flaws, it wasn't really two to the 80. It got down around two to the 70 or two to the 68 and became crackable. So they jumped all the way up to 256 or 512. So even half of that is still a really big number. And that's the game. So SHA-1 should have been fine, and it would have been if it had had no other mathematical weaknesses. But now SHA-2 is much longer and should be fine forever unless something happens to mess rock the boat. Yeah. There is a SHA-3. It was approved about two years ago. It's not any longer, but it uses a different underlying mathematics because SHA-2 is related to SHA-1, and some of the Chinese speed-up techniques might work. So people are afraid that they want something based on different mathematics. So SHA-3 has been approved, and you can download it from GitHub. I had a project, might still be in there, where you play with it, but nobody's built it into anything commercial yet. Yeah. They didn't find collisions. What they did was they found a mathematical flaw that made collisions easier to find. But they didn't have the computing power to actually find the collision. But about 10 years ago, they proved that instead of taking 2 to the 80 calculations, it would really only take 2 to the 76. And then they made an improvement where it would only take 2 to the 72 or something. And that's when uh, the Americans said, well, we have the fast computers. We might be able to do that. And so the two eventually met. That's why everybody knew it was coming. About five or six years ago, they predicted the end of SHA-1, because you could see that. And, and therefore, they became concerned about SHA-2, because if the errors that the Chinese people found continued to be found in more and more and more errors, even SHA-2 might fall. So that's when they had the comp test for SHA-3. But it didn't fall. This is like WPA. WPA was not expected to last long, because it was just four fixes on web. And so they made WPA-2 while using WPA. And it turned out that WPA never was broken. So it's still fine, but it was resting on untrusted foundation. So they created another standard to switch to uh, when they had some time. This is very common. You have a temporary procedure just to patch over the gap while you improve your stuff. The whole world's living through it now with Meltdown Inspector. And just today, there's another generation of Meltdown Inspector. They just found eight more flaws which are currently secret, but they have now revealed that they are exist. So there are serious security problems in our hardware, and that is going to take 10 years to fix. 
They have to develop the new chips and build them and then deploy them. So in the meantime, we have all kinds of temporary patches to try to prevent the attacks while we continue to use this unsafe hardware until we can all upgrade our hardware. Anyway, so ciphertext only attack is where all you do is sniff the packets and see encrypted stuff and you figure out the key from that. All right, um, known plain text is if I can provide stuff and it's encrypted. This is true of a lot of HTTPS sites. I'm logging in, I put in my password, it encrypts the password and I can see the packets. So I can put in carefully chosen passwords, like you might imagine putting in a password that's all zeros except for one, and then all zeros except for one here, things like that might have special mathematical properties, and that's how web cracking works. You feed in special data and watch it come out, and you can pump out the information about the key. That's the chosen plain text attack. Known plain text is where you know what the plain text is, uh, which is, for example, web. If you sniff a network, most of the packets on the network are exactly the same. They are who I am, 192.168.1.101. Who has 192.168.1.1? Tell me. Because they're ARP. ARP packets are easy to spot because they're small. They are very numerous. Everybody that connects to the internet keeps asking over and over again where the router is every few minutes. So that's what most of the traffic is. Even if it's all encrypted, you can totally tell which one's in the ARP, and you can guess almost every bit in it because it's almost always the same. So you know what the plain text is, but you aren't able to change it. Uh, some of the HTTPS attacks that have gotten the news in the last five years, like the beast attack and the crime attack, actually require you to choose careful plain text, which will cause a defect in the encryption. And that is possible for HTTPS websites, but often you have to be in the middle. So that is less practical. Anyway, then there's chosen ciphertext in principle, and I'm not aware of ones that have that. And so the simplest attack is a brute force attack. If the mathematical part is perfect and there is no way to make a shortcut, then the only way to get in is to try every possible key. So that is the best you can do. That's why if the key is too short, you're hosed. Like DES, the key is so short, you can just try every key. Well, in that case, it doesn't matter. You'll never be safe. That's why you have to at least have it long enough that you don't have enough time to try every possible key. Uh, what's actually done now for passwords is you use dictionaries of stolen passwords, so you don't need to try every possible combination of letters. You just try all the known passwords that humans have chosen in the past, and that will usually get you in. And, you know, these various tools can do it. We've done it here with John the Ripper, I think, in this class, and you can use Hydra for online attacks, and Hashcat is the new hotness, and OCL Hashcat is the one that uses your graphics card and is thousands of times faster if you have the right hardware. Um, there's also an old technique you'll hear about uh, called rainbow tables, which is pretty much obsolete now. But before Microsoft updated from their unbelievably horrible algorithm, LM hashes, up to the one that is just horrible, um, which is the current one, NT hashes, this one, you could actually store rainbow tables, which are basically mathematical tables in RAM. It's called a time memory trade-off. Calculating the algorithm could be made much faster by just looking up the answer in a table. So if you used, um, I think, about 500 megs of memory, you could store a table which made it possible to try every possible password in about five minutes on a modern machine. So you could just do a strict brute force attack. But that was possible because LM hashes were unbelievably weak. And one of the most weak things about them is they didn't hash the entire password. They took a password that had a maximum length of 14 characters, and they broke it up into two seven-character passwords and hashed them separately. And they took all lowercase characters and changed them to uppercase. So the total amount of seven character groups was not that large, and you could actually try them all. And that's what Offcrack did, and that's what Rainbow Tables did. But with NT hashes, they don't do that. So if your password is eight characters or longer, the Rainbow Table is not practical. And so um, the man in the middle attack is very dangerous, though, and a lot of systems fall for this. Suppose you manage, this is what they call a privileged position. Suppose I manage to be between the victim and the server, which you can do by hijacking a router, being an internet service provider, rearranging traffic with art poisoning. There are many ways to do this. Once I'm in the middle, now I can just lie to both ends. You try to go to Facebook, I say, yes, I'm Facebook. I hand you a certificate with a key I know. Then I go to Facebook and say, this guy wants to talk to Facebook. They give me a key. So you encrypt your stuff, but I'm reading it. And I'm encrypting stuff and passing it to Facebook. They don't know this is happening, and you don't know this is happening. And I'm totally reading all your data and perhaps altering it. 
It's quite effective, and there is in general no solution for this except a trusted third party. There has to be some other way to know who Facebook is. And there is in principle no way I can tell if my only connection is this one wire. The only thing I can do is have some trusted third party. Now I could be like OpenVPN, the people were talking about, where I have a secret that I typed in on the server and I also typed it in here. So in the past at some time, I had another channel that went directly from one to the other. Now, as long as that secret isn't compromised, now I will detect this because this attacker doesn't know that secret. That's one solution. The other solution is the trusted certificate authority solution used by browsers where there's these special 100 people over here and when I connect, I ask one of them, is this really Facebook or not? And they tell me. And the, even though the attacker is in the middle, they can't fool me about that. So that is the only solution. You have to have some kind of other information to add to what comes over the wire to detect this. Yeah? No, that's not. Uh, is it all, a two-factor authentication is different but similar, where you have two different types of proof of who you are. Uh, something you know, something you have, and something you are. But it is similar in a, in a global scale. You have to have a second source of information of some kind to tell if this is really Facebook or not. And like say H, um, and I mentioned Chrome has a simple solution by just actually building into the browser so it knows who should have signed everything. So it actually knows in the browser who the top 1,000 people should be, and that would help. Yeah. Ah, 2FA is um, the point of two, for a lot of cases where two-factor authentication fails. The simplest case is a targeted attack. If I want to steal one person's identity, then I will steal your token and your password and get in. Uh, the only point of two-factor authentication is it lowers the damage of mass compromise. It is quite common that someone goes to a website and they find a vulnerability like a SQL injection and they steal the whole database. Now they have all the passwords, then they get in all the accounts. You prevent that with two-factor authentication because you steal all the passwords, but now I have to also go steal everybody's phone and then pair them up. That's what it's for. So it does, it's not perfect, but it makes it harder to compromise accounts in mass. Yeah. How about what? YubiKey is the same. I have to steal that physical token. Uh, of course, if you're serious, you can do what the government of China did. Everyone, all the military contractors are using these RSA tokens, and they hacked into RSA and stole the master key. So they defeated two-factor authentication that way. And YubiKey might have some kind of master password for all those tokens. And if they do, that would be a solution. Hack into them and steal that. Yeah, I see it's after an hour, and I don't want everyone to go to sleep. I think we should take a 10-minute break, and then we'll continue. We'll pick up at 11.25. <laughs> I'm going to pause the recording now that I've learned how to do that. And okay. So, so we went to try UCSF. This is the main portal for the main website, and that's all A's, which is what you usually find at www.ccsf.edu. But um, John here found that they have another thing called dp.ucsf.edu that's getting an F. And this is why I say this is very instructive. You can learn a lot about certificates from examining them. So here's why it's insecure. It's insecure because it supports export suites. This is a giant problem caused by the U.S. government. Um, I mentioned the crypto wars. The crypto wars happened in the 80s and 90s when the U.S. government decided, uh, which they're now doing it again. The FBI is doing it again. The U.S. government wanted to get into everything. So they did not want us to publish strong cryptography on the Internet where our enemy nations might get it and use it against us. So they, Microsoft wanted to sell Windows all over the world. And they told Microsoft, you cannot build an operating system that includes strong encryption. So they made a special version of Windows called um, Windows XP N version and K version, which included weak cryptography. And they shipped it to all the other countries. So they had short keys that were easily cracked. So they sold crippled cryptography to all the machines. Now, this is why the, all the cryptographers are very strongly resisting the FBI's current attempt to do the same thing all over again by demanding a backdoor into everything. What happened is they said, well, it's not gonna hurt our citizens because nobody in America uses that version, which is true. But suppose you put up a website like Google. Now, suppose people in China wanna see your website. Your website has to speak the insecure encryption for the people using the foreign export version of the browser. 
So it became a standard practice for every certificate to include insecure cipher sweeps so people in foreign countries could see your website. But if they do, there's a trivial downgrade attack. If I'm in the middle, the original connection to the website, you send a request to the server saying, I want to see your site. I intercept it before anything is encrypted and say, I want to see the website, but I'm using the foreign version, so you have to give me the weak encryption version. And you will never know that has happened. Your browser will not pop up an error message, but all the stuff is unsafe. So now, again, the rules changed on them. Five years ago, everybody, or 10 years ago, everybody's told you have to include these insecure swipe receipts in your certificate because it's against the law for people in other countries to have strong encryption. So you cannot, if you don't do it, nobody in other countries will be able to see your site and you won't be able to do business. So um, now, if you're obeying the old rules, you have this problem. Now this is considered a fatal flaw because it is trivial to trick your browser using the old version. And so this is what they're very afraid of. If you, by law, mandate some hole in encryption, it will have unintended consequences. Another one that has unintended consequences like this is the Great Firewall of China. The Great Firewall of China blocks a lot of websites. And some of them they block by giving false DNS responses. So there are DNS servers in China, and if you ask them where Google is, they will give you the wrong number to prevent you from going to Google. And that would seem to be okay because only people in China should be using that. But the problem is there are automated DNS queries that look for the nearest servers. So in nations near China, sometimes they go to the Chinese server and get the wrong number and put it in the cache. And then it propagates around the world. So just like a disease, these bad entries are leaking out into other countries. This is why cryptographers have said you'll never make it if you have cryptography and some kind of secret exception that's not safe. The only way to make it work is to make really strong cryptography that nobody can get in. If you have a hole, bad things will leak into the hole and the hole will spread and you'll, you'll end up having lost control in practice. And uh, we're having that battle again because the government, of course, has the law enforcement people have a legitimate desire to catch the criminals that are hiding behind that encryption. So they constantly feel like they should have some way to get in especially if they can get a court order and prove probable cause, they really don't see any reason why they don't let them in. And they don't believe the companies that say we made it so we can't get in and that's what we have to do, like Apple. So this battle rages and there is no clear solution. But anyway, that's the consequence here. That's what happened to UCSF. They have an export grade encryption. Uh, so it accepts RC4 ciphers with older protocols. And uh, let's find out about the freak attack is one of the downgrade attacks. And here we go, there's the glorious freak attack. Came out in 2015. You intercept the HTTPS connections and force them to use weak encryption, which you can then crack. So um, what they are doing at UCSF was okay until 2015 when the attack came out. So all this probably means is their certificate is more than two years old. And it was probably perfectly fine when they bought it. And whoever's running this server didn't know they changed the rules on you again, yank the rug out from under you, and now you're getting an F when you're doing what used to be considered just fine quite recently. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah. Yes. 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 And that's a very fair statement. I mean, this is these HTTPS. I've known from experience, nobody will pay a bug bounty for this kind of information. Nobody will take it seriously because it does not mean they can take over your server, get a root shell, steal the whole database. It means they can target an individual other user in a coffee house with a man in the middle attack one by one. And that is not considered a huge risk. So a lot of people, that's why a lot of people don't care. If they're getting an F, but it's, it's an interesting weakness. It's, yeah, that's right, and exactly right. From a CSSP point of view, if you had 100 problems, this would not really be in the top 10. Yeah, and that's why they really hate people like me that publish reports and put it in the news to announce this because now it's becoming a PR problem. Now they have to waste their resources fixing something that's probably not a real big risk to their users. That's why it's, it's tough. You know, there's reputation and scandal and misunderstanding of the whole chain of command everywhere. Anyway, um, so, uh, that's the downgrade attack right here on the slide. In fact, it's the same thing we were just talking about. You, because there were old broken encryption routines, because they were a long time ago, or because they were mandated by law during the crypto wars, 
there are ways to trick browsers and servers into using the wrong encryption scheme, which is easily broken. Um, so anyway, the most common attack against passwords is to use a dictionary of stolen passwords. That's very effective because so many sites have been hacked that there are very good dictionaries. It's based on the Rockview dictionary and others, there are something like four billion known stolen passwords. So anything that anybody would use for a password is in a list that's not very long, and four billion guesses is not too long against old insecure hashing routines like the ones Microsoft uses. If you have a Linux or Apple machine, their hash algorithm is a million times stronger. And if you did the projects, you saw this. So you can't try a billion guesses there at all. You can only try a few hundred or a few thousand guesses in a reasonable amount of time. So just taking your dog's name and putting your birthday after it is good enough in that case. Anyway, um, a replay attack is another common cryptographic flaw. If you do not add a nonce, and there's a, this is something you have to do in cryptography. You don't just take the input and encrypt it with the key. You have to add something random before you do that. If you don't, then that random thing is sometimes called a salt and sometimes called a nonce and sometimes called a seed, but it's all the same thing. You have to add something that's different every time. If you don't, then you're subject to a replay attack. Someone can just record the encrypted stuff and then replay it later and get in. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what the exact meaning is. I know a nonce is uh, something you add before you encrypt it. A seed is typically a random thing you put in to start your random number generator. A salt is what you add to a password. And a nonce seems to be essentially the same thing. Some letters you add to the password before you hash it. A What's that? Oh, that's padding. Padding is another issue. Padding is not random. And padding is just to fit the requirements of block ciphers. You have to have a nonce in addition to that. Yeah. Uh, nonce is it's a somewhat archaic term. It means like a little something. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, in mathematics, it has a precise definition, which there may be some actual difference between a nonce and a salt, but I don't know it. They're all essentially the same. What typically the most common error is they forget to use any of this, which is what Microsoft did. So if two people choose the same password, they have exactly the same password hash. So there are dictionaries of known password hashes that have been around since the 90s that still work on modern Windows machines. That's why you shouldn't do this. And it wouldn't work on Linux or the Mac because they add uh, nonce to the password before they hash it. So many online services are subject to replay attacks because they make the same mistake. When you log in, they give you a key, which lets you in. And I can take the key, it's a cookie, and put it on another machine and it will let me in your account because they forgot to tie it to your machine somehow. They didn't include something in there like your IP address or an anti-CSRF token. And so many, many websites had this problem where they're sending a plain text cookie that logs you in that anybody can steal. So Firesheet was a demonstration of this a few years back. You just open it and you would just see everybody in the coffee house. It would just sniff, steal the cookies, and you could just get in their site. Um, this was true of everybody, Google and Facebook and everybody until about five years ago. Um, Google led the charge in fixing it by just going to 100% HTTPS. So all the traffic is encrypted. And as we talked about before, if you use HTTPS, there's a different key for every session. So I can't even replay your session. So then, even if I continue to use well, cookie and not tie it to an IP address or anything, still, nobody can get the cookie out of the traffic. So Facebook has finally gone to HTTPS and Google and Bing. So that takes them out of this game. It did eventually get fixed. Um, if you get a list of passwords and you crack them, this is technically illegal, which I didn't know. I used to do it all the time. They had a contest at DEF CON and everything. People do it all. I, I cracked a bunch of US military passwords when they leaked and taught it in my class. We did. I stayed up all that night when we had the Stratford hack. When they dumped a bunch of US military passwords, I said, this is awesome. I cracked a bunch of them and took them to class. They had real credit card numbers. It was an exciting time. <laughs> then they locked all those guys up. Then I found out technically I'm illegal too. That's why I thought I was a white hat, but it's awfully hard to obey the law. The law is like really annoying. You can't have any fun without breaking the law is what I found out. But anyway, um, so, so I guess I'm a gray hat. I don't really want to be, but you have to take some risks. Anyway, you get the, ha you get the password file here with etch, pa etch shadow is the file that comes out of Unix. It contains the password hashes. In Windows, it's in a registry called the SAM database. And then you get these hashes, and you can use a variety of programs that will just 
the only way to crack a hash, there is no way to mathematically convert a hash back into the password. All you can do is guess the password, calculate the hash, and see if it matches, and then guess another. So you just try a big list of guesses. There's no faster procedure anybody's ever found. So, all right, there's other vulnerabilities. SSL strip, which you did in the project, is Moxie Marlin Spike, who is one of the leading cryptographers, very famous. He's very um, anarchistic. He's very much against the big government and everything. He lives on a sailboat. He's a California hippie. He, um, he is very much opposing all this government intrusion and big corporations and everything, um, which a lot of cryptographers are. They tend to be sort of anarchist revolutionary types. Um, Anyway, he's very good. He writes a lot of stuff. People trust him more than almost anybody in the business. If he makes a product, and he makes Signal, I think, or maybe not Signal. Yeah, I think it might be. He makes an a, a encrypted messaging system, a whisper, right? And he, and he everybody trusts it because he's on it. He will not let them make any compromises or give any backdoors in it or, or handle the key improperly. So he's very widely respected. And he made SSL strip which just is a proxy that turns HTTPS into HTTP and delivers it to your browser. And I don't think this will work much anymore because the browsers will no longer let you use HTTP, especially by the end of the year. But as you saw, it's devastating until the browsers are upgraded. You see your login page, it looks fine, but it's not encrypted. So you don't need to, it's using HTTP instead of HTTPS. And until very recently, this would work anywhere on the web. But it is a targeted attack. You have to be in the middle. So you can't do it to a thousand people. You can do it to the one person next to you in a coffee house one at a time. Uh, yeah. And if you're now in the middle of hosts, had a its own certificate that you got from the free place, then it would be posted by the browser that you could have happen. No, that's very important. If you are in the middle and you have a certificate, it still won't do you any good because you can't have a valid certificate for Facebook signed by a trusted authority. If you make your own fake certificate, it can't be signed by a trusted authority, so a error message will pop up. However, here's another fun fact. Studies have shown that 99% of the end users have no idea what those error messages mean, and they just close it and keep going. Because um, they pop up all the time for no good reason, like your clock is set wrong or something, or the company forgot to update it. So everyone knows, oh, that crap pops up again, just close that, and then I can still get there and do my work. So. You know, popping up error messages is pretty much useless. This is what Microsoft did. Microsoft made many claims to have the most secure browser because they did real testing and they found out that these error messages saying blah, blah, cryptography is wrong or not helping. So they pioneered, if you go to a phishing site in Internet Explorer or now Edge, the whole screen turns red. It says, do not go here. This site is not safe. You have to go somewhere else. And then down in the corner, it's go here anyway. You can't even find it. And they proved that that actually works. Most people will actually stop at that point. And um, that's why they regard themselves as the most secure, because they're the most effective at communicating to the user that you have a problem. All the other mathematically oriented browsers give you technical information that only an engineer could comprehend. And then they yell at the user, you stupid user, why didn't you ignore, the, why did you ignore that box? I suppose, I'm trying to read my email, and this crap is popping up on my screen. I don't know what it is. It's like a fly landed on it. You sweep that away, and then I can read my email. <laughs> If I wasn't supposed to go there, you should have blocked it. I, I crossed the border in Canada illegally. I went to the border crossing. There was nobody there. There was no gate. The signs didn't make any sense. I didn't think I was at the border yet. I thought they had a detour. I drove through, then these lines go off, these cops come out. You cross the border, but, but, but why isn't there a gate? Why didn't somebody tell me? <laughs> and then he said, people keep doing this. What's wrong with you all? And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> you should invest in a block of wood <laughs> that comes down in front of the car and then miraculously they won't keep doing that anyway um so this is another one that happened um moxie marlin spike found this and so did dan kamiski about six years ago at defcon they reported it they found out that you could buy a certificate for a domain name like this you could buy star and then a null byte eight zeros and then dot evil.com because the certificate authorities were running code that had not been updated in 20 years and it was running pascal and in Pascal, that is a valid string because Pascal does not null terminate strings. That's C. Pascal stores strings where the first byte tells you the length of the string followed by the bytes in the string. So you can have a zero in the middle of a string and it's fine in Pascal. So you can buy that certificate and as far as they're concerned, you just named your servers. Instead of www.evil.com, you named it star zero.evil.com and that's perfectly fine. But your browser is written in C. 
So when your browser, and I go to google.com and I sign it with this certificate, your browser will say, does google.com equal star null.evil.com? Well, null terminates the string and star is a wildcard. So yes, it does equal that and it passes. I can sign any domain with this certificate and your browser will accept it. And that worked. They sold 19 certificates like this and Moxie Marley's bike and Dan Kaminsky were at DAC and DEF CON showing them off and, and they eventually patched it. But this is one of the many holes. Nothing was broken. There was no bug. All the servers, the browser was working as intended. The certificate authority was working as intended. And yet, there was a big hole. And there's a renegotiation vulnerability. It turns out, for some reason, you can send a cancel message to a secure server and say, oh, we need to renegotiate and choose a different key. I don't know why they have that option, but it exists. And there's a way to make it choose another key and choose an unsafe key. That's one that came out. I mentioned the certificate revocation lists tend to be honored more in the breach than the observance. And there are certificate authorities trusted by your browser that probably shouldn't be trusted. The, that came out about three years ago. There's like five or six in there that nobody knows who they are. Mozilla had a bunch of weird company names that nobody even knows who they are. And somehow they got in there and nobody really knows who they are. They're, they look like real company names, but they're off by a little bit. You know, that'd be easy. Just sort of social engineer the browser manufacturer into adding a new trusted binary, and then you can lie. So, that, and all these are not, these are mostly not mathematical problems. The problem is when you handle real objects, there's all these people that get a chance to lie to you at various stops in the chain, and if any of them do, then you've got a hole. Just, there's no real solution to the fact that ultimately you are trusting somebody, and when they are no longer trustworthy, your security is shot. And the math can't fix that for you. All right, so we're down to 12D. All right. Okay. I'll wait a few more seconds. I guess that's it. Okay. All right. So who issues the digital certificates? <laughs> yes, the trusted CA. Right, the certificate authority. Which attack will always work, but it might take some time? Okay, brute force in principle will always work, but if you try to make things long enough that you don't have that much time and then you call it secure. All right, which attack was easier because of export grade encryption? Okay, that was the downgrade attack, which would apparently work against UCSF at the moment. And where do certificates go when they are bad? They go on the certificate revocation list. There's also a newer thing I think called OCSP, Online Certificate Status Protocol, which also doesn't work very well. This is uh, one of the problems in the business, is how to really deal with revoked certificates. So M dot is one twice, John, and Forrest is one twice. Okay, well, I've got the winners, and I've run out of things to teach you. Um, I'm going to clear out and make room for Stuart, who has something. Are you going to do it here upstairs? Upstairs. Go, upstairs will be a hacker club today, and I'll go up there and see if anybody wants help on projects or anything. 
no class next week and a final after that. So I probably won't see any of you again for this course. But I will be checking emails even when I'm in China. So I might be able to help people who are still rushing in late projects. But I think most of you are already done anyway. But if you're not, you still have a week to turn in uh, extra credit projects. And you can turn them into the day of the final, but the loose points are being late. If you need any more time than that, then let me know and I can give you an incomplete. Yeah. Yeah, the, the yellow means you have a B and the green means you have an A. Yeah. And if you and if you want more details, the whole chart is down here. So you can find out exactly what's going on over there. So everybody can figure out what they have to do to get an A and get it. That's fine with me. I don't see any reason to make it mysterious. And the college does not force me to grade on a curve. The first time I taught this course, the first version of this course was a one unit summer course called Internet Safety. It was about 10 years ago. And what we did was virtual machines had just come out. So we put up Windows XP virtual machines and we infected them deliberately with all the most horrible stuff we could find. And then we tried cleaning them, see how much cleaning was. And we were all very excited. This was a lot of fun. I had 30 students and they all got an A because there were like six projects and there were six extra projects and they all did them all because this was really fun. <laughs> and I thought someone would punish me for giving all the students A's, but they didn't. So there's no curve. If you all do enough points, you'll all get an A, that's fine. <laughs> I figured if you'd be like the Army. In the Army, they don't let only the top 10% get an A. They just have a bar. And that's how certification test works. They just need to know this much. And the bar doesn't move because there's more smart people around you. What sense does that make? Anyway. So. All right. What's that? Oh, your code is the last four digits of your student ID. It's on your student ID card, the W number. Or it might start with A or B. So those four digits should be on here. And uh, I can also look it up. So I'm going to stop the share. And if you want help, I can look it up here too. All right.